Okay, good morning, everyone. We're 1030 on the dot, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, we have an exciting lineup today, so just want to share a little bit of information with you guys before we get started. Um, today's session is titled Agency Implementation of Assistive Technology. Um, and this is going to be presented part of the Technology Summit session through the DMHDD um, Technology Summit Drive. So um, we want to give a few little housekeeping notes this morning as this session is being recorded. So we're going to be asking participants to place questions into the chat box or to hold on those until the end of the session. And we'll try to answer those as time allows. We also want to make note that we have um, the Missouri APSI. Um, assistive technology one day training that's going to be held on March 24th from 10 to 3. So additional information can be located on the technology first page under the technology events. Um, I do want to let you know we've had one modification today. So we originally had organized the session to be facilitated by Missouri Division of Developmental Disabilities Director Jess Bax. Um, however, due to the inclement weather causing some connectivity issues for Jess, we are lucky to have um, today's session facilitated by Wanda Crocker, who serves as the Director of Provider Relations for Missouri um, DDD. So Wanda is going to be speaking with Terry Combs and Michael Hartman from Sheridan Valley and Tim Digon of the Ark of the Ozarks on the efforts of their agencies to build assistive technology into the daily service delivery. So um, a big welcome and thank you to our panelists for their participation. And I'm going to turn this over to Wanda to get us started. One, Wanda, I think you're on mute. Wouldn't you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's always got to start off somehow, right? So right. fine to laugh at me. I'd rather you laugh with me, but it's all good. So. Um, Thanks for everybody for being understanding, um, you know, February is so unpredictable and, and Jess just doesn't have good audio this morning. So that would have made it really hard for her to talk with you all. So uh, really excited for Sheridan Valley and Ark of the Ozarks to share um, their experiences and their journey on becoming a technology first agency. Uh, super excited to have them today. So we have some questions that we put together. So I guess I'll just start off and then let you guys take us where it kind of goes and I thought we might just do a little um, introductory to get this conversation going, but could you share with the audience a little bit about why you even started the journey to become a technology first organization? You know, was there a special event or was there just a philosophy change? What made you start going down this path? Yeah, I'd be happy to, to share that uh, to our story, at least here at, at Sheridan Valley. Uh, it's probably been, Mike and I were discussed this morning, probably eight or 10 years ago. And so even though, even though this sounds pretty new to people today, technology has been available for quite some time. And uh, I really wasn't totally interested in technology at the time in implementation and services, but I actually went ahead and went to a session, a learning session, and I thought, well, I need to have an open mind because certainly at some point in our future, this is, this will be something that that's prevalent for the people we serve. And um, I went through list, learned about the presentation, learned about technology, how it could how it could be implemented. And uh, I was impressed by that, but that really wasn't what sold me. What sold me was uh, in the break uh, halfway through the session, I had the opportunity to meet a parent of a, a family member who has uh, disabilities in this particular case with traumatic brain injury. And they were using technology at that point in time. And the family member shared with me what a delight, what a positive experience had it been for them and their family. And in this case, this individual had went through multiple roommates unsuccessfully in an ISL setting, and it had been a disaster literally for their family. And they didn't know what to do. They were aging. They were wondering about their daughter, what would happen to her when they were no longer able to step in and care for her. And uh, this was, had just been a godsend to them. And so that one conversation, so it wasn't the presentation, but it was that conversation uh, that made me realize that um, one, this works for people, two, it's safe, three, people are going to want this either now, either yesterday, today, or tomorrow. And, and finally, uh, if as an agency uh, CEO or leader, if I was not going to consider this for the people we serve, I really wasn't being as person centered as I should be. And quite frankly, it was being a little selfish. And so I came back to the organization and said, you know what, we're going to figure this out and we're going to provide it as an option for people. And that's how it got started. 
Thanks, Jerry. I think uh, ours is much of the same, except I think ours really started with looking at the workforce crisis and saying, hey, we have to be thoughtful and creative about how we provide supports. And I'm a firm believer in technology. I love technology, but I also believe that technology should supplement person to person interaction, not supplant it. So we want to find a good way to integrate remote supports and other assistive technologies in our service model. We have over 360 individuals in uh, residential supports throughout our agency with over 1,200 staff. And as you can imagine, over the last several years, um, even before the pandemic, we were stretched thin with staffing issues. Uh, except the pandemic, pandemic's accelerated it. But ours really dug down to a deeper philosophical level. I, I think back in 2019, we're really considering going full, even though we did some remote supports and assistive tech, we weren't doing enough. And I felt like, especially in the state of Missouri, sometimes we're so focused on, if there's a problem, we need to staff. If there is a problem, provide a staff. And I found that really in, in our culture at the ARC too, is that whenever we, one of our staff had a problem, they thought they needed another staff or that more staffing is always the answer. And the opposite is oftentimes true. I think sometimes that's been our default position is we wanna go get more staff, even though they don't exist, uh, to provide the supports. We wanted to change our mindset. We launched a thing called Pathways to Greater Independence uh, in beginning of 2020 before the world broke apart. Uh, and that there was really three initiatives. One is greater employment supports. Two is assistive technology remote supports. And the third was reduced service hours. And we want to marry those three concepts to create greater levels of independence for the people we support. And by changing the internal minds of the organization to get them thinking differently about how we provide support. So that was our big push into it and the ways we were looking at it. Would you uh, share with the audience um, techniques or approaches that you employed to show the value and receive buy-in for the use of technology? Yeah, yeah. so uh, it, it starts with the organization, of course, and so there has to be a commitment. So anything you want to start that's new, you can, somebody's going to be a naysayer. So there's always going to be the naysayer out there that's going to say, you can't do that, this person can't do that. A great example, Mike Hartman, who is who is our leader now at CBA in technology uh, oversight and, and delivery, really, he had, he was against it. So when we started, he was a manager for us. And when we started this and we mentioned a particular individual, he says, there's no way. There's no way he can use this. As soon as that comes on and the staff leaves, he's out of the house. Well, I fought it, too, that, that because the individual already had systems in place, he had free time. And he didn't even stick to that. Like he would tell the staff, I'm leaving and I'm going to hang out at the club. I'm like, and then Terry comes and say, hey, we're going to start, you know, remote supports and we're going to put this guy. I'm like, are you serious? Like he's going to have a party here every night? No, <laughs> you know? And so um, I, I love though, uh, one, I'm, I'm open, even though I said it, I'm always open to ideas. And so Terry brought alongside um, uh, remote supports uh, night out actually, and came and did a presentation at one of our meetings and we had a chance to ask questions, um, talk about things, and then we went back to planning and that opened my mind up to some possibilities like, you know, um, why not? That, and that's honestly the thing, why not? Why not try because what was going on wasn't working and the definition of insanity is continue to do the same thing over and over again and, and think you're gonna get a different outcome and that just wasn't working. So yeah, I was a naysayer and now I'm a sayer, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, that's, I mean, it's perfect. That's a perfect example. You know, and we've got numerous, you know, back to what Tim said earlier, you know, about people that we want to put more staff in. And so we, we have one example we were, we were joking and laughing about earlier this morning about an individual who has had two staff to one individual uh, with, a, with a different provider, had completely destroyed his apartment, and, uh, and we had decided to take on his services, put him in with minimal direct staffing, and and utilize the remote technology services and gave uh, set up a plan so that if the individual decided that the, he didn't want the staff in his place he could tell them it was time to go and they had the the authority to leave and let us know and guess what worked beautifully for the guy he uh, didn't he did not destroy his apartment we didn't have any police involvement all those things and that's we have story after story but the other thing is we say well it can't work for that person well I would agree, don't start with your most difficult person. So if someone has the most difficult behaviors in your agency, that's not the person to start with. Mm -hmm. But don't don't determine upfront that that could never work for that person because you'll be surprised. Start with the folks that maybe have sleep shifts, those sorts of things, 
those are a little easier to get started. And then, of course, the education piece. I know Tim probably wants to add to that. So, I think a lot of what Terry um, might said as well. Um, I think I'd like to point out a couple of specific examples that were really depressed. Really, the, the game changer for us is proving it works, right? We had an individual who has, you know, some depression and suicidal thoughts once in a while. And we had this person on remote supports so and people thought we were crazy at first. But what we found is we gave her the skills to cope and deal with those things um, independently. She was able to reach out when she had those feelings or thoughts. She reached out to remote support staff proactively and talked it through and she was fine. The moment that happened, her, her whole team fought in because they saw that, wow, we thought this wouldn't work and it worked wonderfully and it worked uh, really well for the individual. In, in fact, it empowered the person we support because she was able to make those things independently. She didn't have a staff in her house telling her what to think or how to, how to go through this. She proactively reached out when she was, was having those thoughts and feelings. The second one is uh, we worked with Hero to, um, we had an individual who has significant seizures and this person specifically lives at home. They're not in residential supports and they just needed some additional supports in the home. Uh, so we worked with a family um, that they were really concerned about this. So we we actually put in a seizure mat. We we pilot tested a seizure mat to determine when the person was having seizures. And once we got the pilot through and we got this in the system, the mom called our staff crying. She says, I feel like a terrible parent. And, she, and she's like, why do you feel that way? She's like, I thought my child was having two or three seizures a day. And he's having five or six seizures a night. The, the seizure mat caught five to six additional seizures that would not been caught by staff that were out, you know, elsewhere or the family. And we we're able to take that data after 30 days and present it to a neurologist to, to update medications to reduce the seizure thresholds. Um, you know, since that time, we implemented another seizure mat with someone else that um, had overnight staff. And our staff were really concerned about, wow, this person has seizures. What happens if this happens? And we we're able to share that story about the success story of the seizure mat that happened with that at home person. Uh, with this staff to, to get buy-in and then they really bought in when we were caught additional seizures that the staff didn't catch three seizures a night because they were very short abrupt you know between uh, 45 and 60 seconds by the time the staff got in there from hearing some commotion the seizure would have been over so we we're able to catch those seizures and share that data but i really think um not only it, does it increase levels of independence but i think it allows our ability to create um even greater medical oversight for some of those issues that people don't often think about. But I think the, the biggest thing is, um, like Terry mentioned, start with the individuals that are, are, are gonna do best to start, start with. Remove the overnight staff that, you know, the person are there just in case and, and start small. Once you start having some success stories, your staff will buy in. So I, I think the biggest impediment to, to really integrating these, these technology supports well is internally at organizations where we're so resistant to those change. Yeah. Our experience mirrors that as well, Tim. And Mike, I would say you're not a, a technology sayer, you're a technology singer now. <laughs> you have graduated to singing about technology. So I'm a, I, this is being recorded, so I'll show my wife because I can't sing and she can. So thank you. <laughs> well, well, we're glad you changed your mind about technology and stayed with Sheridan Valley to make a difference. That's for sure. Um, and so you talked a lot about a lot about your techniques and supports uh, to convince staff um, about those changes. Um, did you utilize different strategies for parents? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I'll, I'll start. Yeah, you, you go ahead if you want to chime in, and I'll uh, add to. It. Well, so again, uh, Terry mentioned it directly, right? So it started with Terry. He came into our company, our admin, and with any system you bring in. If your top isn't bought into it, it will not work. So our top had to buy into it. Once we bought into it, it became a more, okay, what are our processes? How are we going to bring buy-in? Who do we have to get buy-in from? I mean, the individuals obviously hit the word independence. I, I, I Tim hit it right on there like they want more independence. That's easy for them. But then the parents and guardians are, they're always, you know, they're concerned about things. So we have multiple guardians that they're like, okay, just like I was at first, like there is no way this is gonna happen. And so we began, um, I, we kind of started off, so we, the same interview I'm talking about that walk out, his systems were in place that we began to transition slowly. So it was always a slow progress and it was always about data tracking and checking back in. So as we began everything, we, we kept every uh, system we already had in place. So staff was still in the home. All these things were still in place 
and the systems were then brought in. And then we watched how this person interact. We started with increments of an hour. So we actually 15 started with 15 minutes. minutes, to be honest with you. So maybe it was overnight staff. We said from 11 to 11, 15, this individual would stay, you know, by themselves. And we gave that, you know, two weeks and saw what, you know, what were the uh, dangers, what things were we noticing, uh, what calls were we getting? And then and as we increased, we increased then to uh, a 30 minute increment. Then we went to an hour. Then we started by hours. And over for us, a month and a half to two months, checking back in every two weeks with every member of the team and showing data to go, okay, this is what happened. We ran into this issue and this is what happened. Um, I, I believe that brought a lot of buy-in from our guardians who were very hesitant, but they were very, they were okay with us slowly transitioning that way, um, especially with someone that already had that amount of time. It was so much easier they had amount of free time in them anyway. Yeah, it's great. And I, I would add too that in some guardians, we just spent a whole year just planning for it. And so we didn't do anything other than talk about it for a whole year. Mm -hmm. uh, we were in line with the service coordinator partnership, uh, who was also in line with the technology and, and understanding the value of it. And then uh, we, we would start with the Guardian. And every time they would say, well, what about this? We would say, here's our plan. Mm -hmm. And here's how we're going to train the individual to be able to respond to themselves in that particular scenario. And then here's our backup plan. Here's our response plan. And in some cases, we, we took an entire 12 months just to do that piece. I would echo all those same sentiments. And I think, um, you know, our biggest variable is approaching the situation with humility. And in and, and doing so, I think it's, it's really wise to have a really good plan ahead of time. So talk about all the, in case of failure, here's our backup. In case of that ba failure backup, here's our secondary backup. I think being thoughtful about how you approach the situation and show that one, your number one priority is health and safety, making sure the person is is safe, uh, is is paramount. But but secondly, I think that that commitment to you know allowing people to grow uh, within certain safeguards and talk about how the safeguards can be guardrails, you know, as a person grows and becomes more independent, is really important. But we really approach the situation with humility and and some, and we we admit uh, you know remote supports in particular is not always for everybody. I mean, it's just not going to work for everybody, but I believe it works for a lot more people than we think it will work for. Absolutely. You guys are making some really, really excellent points. I'm so excited about this conversation. And for everyone's knowledge, all of these sessions are going to be recorded. So people who weren't able to attend will be able to watch them later, or maybe it can become a tool for other communication efforts um, with providers or families or individuals who need uh, to understand the broader picture. So I'm really excited about the information you guys are sharing. Um, can you talk a little bit about what kind of direct support professional shifts um, you had to make um, and what were the ad advantages that you experienced regarding staffing and technology implementation? Tim, why don't you start this one? Yeah, I can start. Um, I think I'll start with the advantages. You know, I think um, once our direct support staff saw how it worked, they were excited. We had a lot of people apply to be, we, we call them remote support professionals. Uh, right now, we're providing overnight 11P to 7A, but we're looking to expand those hours and do some stuff during the day. Um, but the immediate results we did see, being short staffed, is we were able to reduce, in each home we implemented this, we, we reduced by about 2.4 FTE or so. So the burden on staffing does help significantly. And I think it resonates through your agency when you see, hey, we, we, we talk about this working and how it can help the agency as well as the individual. It's, it's a it's a win win. I think when you see that reduction in the burden on overnight staff, which oftentimes are very hard to find, um, it, it resonated significantly throughout the organization. I think uh, what it also did with our staff, especially the people that converted that moved over from DSP to remote support professional is it gave them a different viewpoint of how supports can be provided. I think we've been pretty conventional on talking about how our DSPs provide supports and it's been sometimes one dimensional um, and, and it's always person to person. I think this opened the avenue for people to think differently about how supports can be provided that you may be able to offer the same support uh, remotely. Uh, you may be able to even provide different supports remotely that you wouldn't be able to provide in person because there's that there's that natural trust. Uh, one thing that really stuck with me um, is one individual we started with overnights, uh, we moved overnight staff and started with remote supports, is every time our remote support um, director goes into that home to, to check in with her and, and talk with her, she says, do you, you know that I don't even have overnight staff anymore? I'm, I sleep in my own home alone. And that's that resonates. I mean, 
to have that level of where that person's never had that level of independence. Could you, could you imagine just putting yourself in that situation where you are excited about because someone's not sleeping in your house that night? That's yeah. some of the subtle things that we that uh, we take for granted. Um, I think we need to open our minds up a little bit more and really think broadly about how this can impact our service model. And I think to a certain degree, that's really happened with our staff that moved over. It's so we, we've seen this the, the shift in the burden of staffing, but also I think from a philosophical standpoint in how we provide supports has opened up our minds and avenues on way we can do things differently. Yeah, and I would only add our situation is just a little bit different only because we don't operate our own call center. We utilize the third party to do that, but we do the responder piece, of course, mm -hmm. and, and we have a multi-tiered system to do so. But as far as the staffing, you know, we all know between the turnover rate and the volume of services that's needed, there's always an opportunity for a staff person to go somewhere else within your organization. So we didn't lose staff because of this. We provided opportunities for them to work at a different uh, program or location or a different, different time. And, and, um, and so there was, there was certainly, it was really a positive, obviously it reduced our number of FTEs or full-time equivalencies as Tim mentioned. And of course that put, uh, reduced our recruitment, uh, challenges at, at least at that time, although, you know, now they're, they're beyond unprecedented, but, <laughs> but anyway, it, it's a real positive in that way. And then to add to it on the other side of it too, just coming from, you know, another side of angle, um, that buy-in piece is extremely important because that was another thing that the staff in the home, starting with our lead supervisor in the program, what are going to happen to my staff? I have staff that work full-time hours. They're going to lose their jobs. They're going to lose their jobs. What are you going to do with them? And so like, just as Terry mentioned, um, or we had some that had guaranteed. Yep. Yeah, we, we did guarantee, but there were others that said they had worked so long with the individuals that, why are you moving me from this individual? Like, why are you, and honestly, they thought that we were making money. I shared and Valley making money on the individuals. And so we actually, along with the buy-in, when Terry, uh, we didn't even mention this at the beginning, but we had meetings amongst our admin team. We met with guardians, but then we had meetings with our staff. We had like staff-wide meetings, like company-wide meetings where we talked about, and Terry led the charge on, hey, this is what's going on, and this is the plan, and this is how we're going to re-equip or give you more tools to make you even more efficient. And in the end, it is our mission statement. Our mission statement, how are we providing those services primarily and to help a person live independently? How can they live independently? If your goal and your mindset becomes what challenges, what hurdles can I overcome to support the people to live independently, to not really need you? I, I learned that 20 some years ago. How can I work myself out of a job? And but but along with that, keep the person safe. And once we began that buy in, and once we had some success stories, I was thinking about a couple like one when we have a, a young lady um, that, that doesn't speak. Uh, she ha is nonverbal. Um, and there was no way to like, well, what happens if, the, you know, she uh, somebody comes in and what happens if this happened? And the first call we got, actually, I had to go out to her home in my pajamas. Um, she just opened the door because she wanted to see someone. And I came in and she said, I don't want to see you. You look bad in your pajamas. I said, I said, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm just trying to get here to help you. But that's more of what you found was people that weren't used to the systems being changed or weren't used to having people in their home. Being alone. And, and, and that's what we, and that was the most shocking thing out of this. You know, the, the gentleman we talked about earlier where he would leave a lot. But I got a call from him. He said, man, I'm scared. And I was like, what are you scared about? And he said, there's no one here. I hear the clock. I hear the clock. I don't know what's going on at home. And it and it and that even brought me in even more to go, wow, I never even thought about that, that you would be scared about. I thought you would want to throw a party and try to test the system in that way. But your first initial reaction is that you're scared because you had had a consistency of staffing being there. And now that you were beginning to get something or gain more independence, it kind of scared us. So then we changed our model too, as far as adding in, okay, how do we come alongside the individuals we're supporting to help them even as they gain these access to this uh, technology and they become successful with it as well. So it's exciting all the way around. So this, so it, this, it kind of goes along with that. I'm sure you do lots, you do lots of outreach with staff, lots of communication, lots of planning invariably there's always someone you can't change their mind and they can't get on the technology train 
How do you handle when you have staff who simply um, you, you just find that, you know, they're, they're very negative about it. They can't get on board and maybe you find they're sabotaging efforts. So how, how do you go about dealing with those kinds of uh, permanent naysayers? Well, we have a philosophy here at CBA that if you're making a decision that's good for the individual, you're making a decision that's good for the company. Mm -hmm. And anybody that doesn't follow that philosophy won't be here if they won't adjust that attitude. So it, not that we want to ever get rid of any staff person, but the reality is we, we were able to, to work with people. Yeah. And again, because we didn't we didn't ramrod it. We, we planned well. We, we didn't set a specific timeline that it had to be completed. And so along the way we built built and built the buy-in and so we really didn't have any of the people that really that. dug their feet in and just said they're not going to no way or sat or we felt like a sabotage well that i think a main component of it also is that you listen you listen as a as a the people that are bringing this in the admin team as you're starting this with your companies listen to all parties that are involved listen and i love the word you said tim humility mm -hmm. be listen and be humble yeah we I, I don't have all the answers, even though we've been doing this for some time. I am constantly learning new things, and it, that's why this excites me. So I apologize if it comes across the screen that way, but I'm always excited about the next thing, just as my CEO Terry's next to me, as he's excited about the next thing and driving the next thing. And we do that by slowly going into it and listening to everybody that's involved. So much of the same, and one thing, Wanda, we found is some our biggest naysayers have turned into our biggest advocates. You know, much like Mike's story, I think um, oftentimes those people are really against something uh, with passion, uh, really become the ones that are very passionate about that technology once once they really see it work. Um, and that, that's the biggest thing is the plan preparedness and, sh and proving that it works, not just saying hey, we want to do this because we think it's the right thing, but it works. And it's safe. The, the, the number one thing that always comes up is. Oh my gosh, it's, that, that can't be safe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the reality is, in my opinion, I believe it's safer in most cases than having a staff person on site. So, yeah, I, I frequently use some of the, when I'm talking with other providers who are starting the journey, I frequently use some of the success stories that you all have shared with me of, you know, well, everyone wants to throw the, the what if. What if? I'm like, okay, so what if? So, what would happen in that same situation if staff were present? Well, mm -hmm. if staff were present, it, it could have gone down a very bad path when that person broke into someone's home. It could have gone into somebody getting hurt, but it, it was able to be mitigated by the technology and the interface with the call center. And so um, I think people want to what if sometimes to death. And, and there's, <laughs> there's always, you know, a, a, another way of looking at the what if. Um, that things can work. And I love your examples of the seizure because I, I get that all of the time, but they have seizures. Uh, uh, well, when they have seizures in the middle of the night, does staff know? Uh, what are they even doing about it? You know, and so thinking about the, the, the what ifs, but what if it happens when staff are there? So what's the benefits and the pros and cons? So I love that you brought those out. Um, so I know that this is not as fun. This is not as exciting, but we all have systems, right? So yeah. when you were doing this, you probably had to make some shifts in the way you your systems operated too. Can you talk a little bit about systems you had to explore modifying to accommodate your technology first movement? Yeah, our situation is a little unique uh, because we we have our own call center, so our remote support staff um, that that work our work for the ARC. So uh, we just have the technology supplied to us, Hero. So. Um, we had to really re-envision our on-call services for one. Uh, we wanna make sure our first line of defense is our remote sports team, including the management of the remote sports team ahead of uh, just the, the, the program supervisors over that program. But that created some, um, some additional obstacles with communication. So we wanna make sure we're really fluid with our communication between one program and another, since our remote sports team is a you know, different program. Uh, so we, we had to really adjust our on-call processes and policies, as well as internal communications and that way we communicated Make sure all that stuff was was appropriately communicated. Um, aside from that, we really looked at our all of our policies and processes, our assistive technology technology processes and policies, as well as our IT infrastructure and and, and processes. So we we really looked at all those pieces to update those to make sure that um, those systems were adjusted. But the biggest obstacle definitely was um, making sure that we we adjusted the on call processes. The second thing is, you know, if you do your on call center, making sure you have staff cross trained as a remote support staff that can come in and fill in. 
uh, you know, when someone's sick or, or you have someone abruptly leave your organization, you want to make sure you have an adequate ability to be able to pull those staff in that are adequately trained to do it and, and really are, are big support on that. So we had to look at all those pieces with sub staff, make sure they're cross trained, uh, the on call process and policies, as well as our, all of our internal uh, communications policies and then IT. The fun stuff, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, I, the only thing I would add is just reiterate that on call piece. So we have a triple layer response on call. Uh, for this particular, uh, for those that we serve that are in using remote technology, particularly at night. So, because we, we have a backup to the backup to the backup, just in case. So, yeah. and then to add on to that. So, um, our 1st level for us, uh, cause we're responders is our supervisors within the program. When we 1st began this process, um, the company, um, that was, uh, doing it for us, which was night owl, they had a 20 minute uh, window that you had to respond by. So we began by looking at, uh, cause we have the, the in-person piece. Yeah. So, the okay. in-person, I apologize. Yeah. And so since we're rural, we have people that stay further away from programs. So we started with, okay, who stays within our leadership 20 minutes away from the program. And then we rotated the on-call shifts to basically we honestly, when we first started, had a night owl on call like group. So those, all the people in that group were able to get to the home in 20 minutes, actually 15 minutes or less sometimes. 10 minutes or less for the home, um, they weren't really far away. So those were the ones they had like a main group of six that kind of ran that. Um, and then the cross training, they were all cross training those programs. That's honestly how on call system runs. Um, they were cross trained to be able to fill in to do. We had to create new uh, form sheets for responders. So like when they responded, they would, we were back in the days of paper and pen. We would write down everything that occurred when they responded. Um, so that that report could go to the home so they could see things and also to that manager of that program so they could plan ahead for any other issues. But also those reports went to the guardian so they could see when we responded what things we were noticing when we responded. I think one of the, the it, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Mike and Terry, but you're still using two different remote support entities in your organization, right? Yes. So that also is something that makes you a little unique. Um, I'm not aware of any other organization that is serving people who have chosen more than one remote support vendor. So that puts an additional nuance that you have staff who have to understand two different systems when implementing. Um, and uh, I know you've talked about perhaps changing that and you've decided against, you know, you wanna stay with what you have because it's successful. Can you talk a little bit about your experience with, making sure people have choice between the vendors that they're supporting. Um, yes. And honestly, to be totally honest with you, we're, <laughs> we, we always are looking for a new, it, it's not about, so the main goal, again, the individual is at the center of everything that you do. So no one technology, no one system works for one in to say every individual. So you find what works for that individual. So the reason that we stayed, with the systems we have because they work for the individuals <laughs> that are there, whether it's one system or two, they just work. Uh, and so that that's a big thing. But along with the training of our staff, we actually, because uh, we do an on-call calendar, uh, so all the leads and everybody know, hey, here's who's on call, all the staff know that. We actually make that available and we do it every month to those uh, call centers as well. So we send information to them and they're aware, okay, I know that this night, this person is on call, I can contact them by this manner. Um, and if I can't get this person, here's my second level. So we, we communicate frequently with both of our providers, um, whether there's you know, batteries that go out, things that need changing, um, with our, we just became shift accredited. So we have a, a tech team that would now be uh, kind of a hands-on, uh, uh, equipment failure, you know, people go out and check the equipment to check things. That was usually myself and Linda, you know, a couple of people, but now we're going to spread the wealth <laughs> a little bit. So. Uh, all these things we think about continue to work on. Yeah, and just we're, we're loyal to the individual's needs first. And so if at any point, you know, their needs change and it can't be met by a particular vendor, we're going to see who else is out there that's going to provide what that person needs, even though we have great partnerships and relationships mm -hmm. with the two that we currently work with. So. And I know one of one of the things that's not really, we're talking about it and I, I hear it, but one of the things that I don't think people will really 
are, you know, may, maybe not just, just very clear is that through your journey, you're creating um, opportunities and development and a, um, a, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? A um, career path for your DSPs because, um, you know, because, you know, ARC does have the call center and that creates different types of positions. Um, Sheridan Valley, you have this tech team and you have special on call systems. And so, um, you know, so I think that's really exciting that that's one of those things that we hear from DSPs is I'm so one level. I don't have a lot of opportunities. I don't have places to grow. Your organizations are creating those paths. Um, have you found that that has impacted your retention? I know it's a horrible question because COVID <laughs> threw all retention out the door, right? We can't control that. Um, but even before COVID or, or now that it's getting a little better, those, those staff that have started on those, um, those paths of a uh, career path and they can see, hey, I have room to grow and to change and, and grow in the agency. Have you noticed a difference in them? Um, how's that impacted your staff creating those new levels for staff to reach to achieve? We're still early into having our own call center, but the individuals that became remote support professionals, I think our retention rate is like 40% better so far. Um, and it does really give a, a next step for a DSP who's been a DSP for a long time and wants to do something new and different and you know move up, move up and, and eventually become a manager. This gives an extra step, you know, that allows them to use their skills in different ways. So we we have found it to be effective so far, uh, but we'll see where that takes us because uh, really it's been complicated through COVID, and um, we're, we're anxious to see where if if that holds or if it doesn't. Yeah, and you know we don't do the call center like Tim, although I've seen the data, Tim, and and nationally I think the trend is that yes, the turnover rate is lower. In those positions, but historically, those positions usually pay about 25% more, which also helps, uh, you know, as we, as we continue to, to be challenged and address that with our Missouri and legislators and federal legislators and but the need to address the crisis. But, um, you know, we don't do the call center, but we do see, but we do promote internally mm -hmm. and we see people's interest in be using uh, technology as, as a great tool, but also as a value, you know. In their in their development, and so you know we see that as then gives them greater opportunity to be promoted as well throughout the organization. So now I'll get back on on script. I know you, I probably thrown a couple of questions at you you weren't expected, but you just led me there. It was just beautiful information. It had to be shared. So, um, but uh, it, and I kind of know a little bit about the stories of what your organization's original goals were. For technology, and I know a little bit about where you are right now, but can you share? Did your imp original implementation plan go as planned? Did it move as quickly as you'd hoped? Did you have to readjust your plan? Um, where are you at now? Um, no, our plan failed miserably because COVID hit in the middle of our plan. And but but I, I am proud though because we we had I think only two individuals on remote supports, maybe one. Uh, before before that implementation plan, we hit 32. Our goal is to hopefully be close to 100 um, by this time next year. It's very aggressive, but we really want to be on the forefront of this and show people how it works. And and it's the benefit of the person we serve ultimately. Um, but no, it did not go as planned because of COVID. Uh, but honestly, even even if you know, a perfect world, I think it probably wouldn't gone as quickly as I wanted it to. I, I tend to be a little more. We tend to be a little more aggressive with timelines. Want to be aggressive, but. You really have to take this in stride and listen to the feedback around you while you push forward. You need to listen on the sidelines and hear what people are saying and, you know, listen to their concerns and, and really. I think you can do a lot of, of disservice to your organization and the people you support if you push forward too quickly. Without getting buy in along the way, so we, we found that, you know, slowing down a little bit and listen to the feedback and trying to think about all those elements and what ifs as much as you can is beneficial in the long run because you get buy-in. So you wanna be careful not to forge ahead too much with just an aggressive plan because you wanna achieve that end result. The process is just as important as the outcomes in this, in this particular case. So you wanna make sure your process is just as important. Yeah, the only thing I would add is just, and of course this is common in our field, but 
each person's plan is going to be different. Absolutely. Every person's. And, and what you have to modify and adjust will be different for every person. And as you begin implementation, the time frame is going to be different for every individual. So we've had some folks like, yeah, let's do this. And we went from zero to 60 in a matter of, of weeks mm -hmm. from zero implementation to full implementation. Others, as I said, it took 12 to 15 months and we were fine either way. We didn't push the, the envelope either way. And as a key uh, component uh, that Tim mentioned that listen, um, as you're implementing your plans, the plan is gonna change because the what ifs happen, the questions happen. The people that know the individuals best will come with those great questions. Again, I don't have to be the smartest person at the table because my whole goal is to focus on implementation with the individual. How can we help this individual succeed? And again, it's just a shift in your thought process when you think about the success side of it rather than the what ifs and the we can'ts. How can we help this person to succeed? And then let's listen to the team. And that's where you get your buy-in at because now they feel like, hey, my words, what I say, my opinions are valued. And thank you for that. And that really, really did a lot of buy-in for us and our company as well. Keeps everybody focused on the ultimate goal too, which is, mm -hmm. you know, because if the naysayers, you know, obviously it's easy for them to come up and say, well, what about this and that? And, and the question should be, how does that help the person become more independent? Mm -hmm. And because if we always refocus the conversation on the individual, it helps redirect those conversations. That's, yeah, that's really strong stuff. That's really powerful. I know when we announced that we were a technology first state, people immediately started comparing states to states, right? We're, <laughs> we're great to compare data. We're great to, hey, who's in the race first? Um, but I, I do think you're absolutely right. It comes, it comes back to what's the purpose and how do we get there correctly and in the best interest of the person. And sometimes you have to spend a lot of time in planning and then revamping that plan. And uh, uh, the important part is that we're on the journey, not necessarily how fast we get there. So I appreciate that. Um, I think my, we're doing great on time. Uh, one of the last question that I'm supposed to ask you is if you have one gold nugget of information that you want to share and, and, and implant with other people, what would it be? Oh, uh, I guess I'll jump in first. Um, and I kind of was telling Terry this because we were joking around and just, we love to talk this. So it's not really a nugget of information. It's honestly a question to those that haven't started this. Why not? That That's my golden nugget. <laughs> why not? Uh, why not? And I'll repeat it one more time. Why not? Um, what I have... What we what we have found as an agency is that, and we're talking about remote supports. We have individuals that utilize uh, med planners. We have lots of different types of tech. And what we find is that, uh, even in just talking about med planning, our individuals make less med errors than, than our staff do. Because down on paperwork and the EMTs, we have to turn in on a, on a basis, you know. Um, but the why not aspect, because if the if an individual can succeed, if they can become more independent. Um, if that can be done safely and done in a in a great plan, which if you have staff there and you have issues, you still have to have a plan in place that you're trying to work on to help that person succeed. It's the same thing. Why not? And so that just my goal. Now, just start, start, you know, start uh, learning. I'm glad people are here in this conference uh, listening to this, but just start, go back, think, plan, get some think tanks going and, and plan it out. Who can we start with? Who are the people we can now? Who can't we start with? Who can we start with and then go from there? Yeah, just real, I just want to add that early on in the process, we, we developed a three tier list. So those folks for stage one, stage two, and stage three, and it got more difficult in our stages mm -hmm. based on the needs of the individuals. And we successfully completed that in all tire, all three stages mm -hmm. of that plan. Of course, that's been several years ago and every day now, we always say, how can we put technology in to help this individual be more, more independent in every service we, we provide too, not just residential. I think my, my biggest uh, goal nugget would be um, in approaching this, it's really not just implementing another program or developing a new program, it's a change of mind how you provide And I think you have to you have to address it this way because of 
there's a there's a weird convergence of several elements, right? You have, of course, a pandemic related staff shortage. We have the impending labor shortage that was accelerated by the pandemic. If you look at the trajectory of needs between now and 2029, just in our long term service supports alone, we can't meet the need. In fact, demand is going to grow while the staff support is going to be even less. So the crisis we're experiencing now, unfortunately, there's no good news. We go from probably bad to worse over, over the long haul. So conventional thought processes and conventional programming got us to where we are today, right? We cannot forge in the future without changing our mindset and thinking differently and being able to be creative and thoughtful about how we do it. You have to ignore the noise and find a way to, to forge ahead a little bit um, on an unconventional path and be thoughtful about how you provide supports. And it's really about changing your mindset. Great point. Those are awesome, awesome little nuggets to share with people. Um, so that is the end of kind of our exploration with our panel. Um, I have not seen any questions in the chat, but if anyone has any questions, feel free to add those now. We do have a few moments that um, we could explore your questions. Hopefully we didn't lose half of our attendees due to <laughs> weather inter interruption with uh, hopefully people could hear, but gentlemen, you're phenomenal. I love your responses. I'm just, I'm really excited about having this conversation out there for other people, other providers um, to listen to, because I think what you've shared is just really good paths um, and ideas for people to consider as they move forward. And I love the why not. I was trying to figure out how to quote you for our next <laughs> statewide provider meeting in technology, <laughs> you know? So, um, gentlemen, we don't have, oh, wait, oh, I think we just got a question. Okay. How do you approach the idea of these supports with guardians, parents that may be hesitant? <laughs> so, first of all, uh, listen, you know, that's common. So, listen to their concerns. And then develop a plan around their concerns and continue to, to go back to them and say, here's our plan. And then also, it, it also comes with training the individual to implement a safety plan because 99% of those issues usually are questions, excuse me, not issues, but questions are around safety. And the other thing is bring the providers in that you, if you're not doing your own call service, there's multiple providers out there come in, they have national data. The, about the, the effectiveness of system, systems, about the safety of systems, about the response times, all that information, every piece of that that you put together is uh, helpful to the family to be more comfortable. And again, don't rush it. If they want to take a year or two years to do it, don't give up, you know, implement with other people and continue to work with those folks. Uh, eventually, you'll be able to, sh to show them, demonstrate them that it will work and it's safe and that uh, they will feel comfortable with giving it a shot. Uh, to add to it, thank you, Terry, it was great. I think you move at the speed of trust when it comes to guardian, you move at the speed of trust. And so that's why all of our, honestly, our plans when it comes to this, we, again, that take your time, move slow to make sure that everyone is comfortable at your markers, whatever you said in your markers when you begin your plan, make sure everyone is comfortable. Um, whatever questions they have, always be open, um, be honest when there's something that's failed, be out of like, hey, this is not working correctly. Let's meet together again. Again, you don't have to be the smartest person in the room. <laughs> Bring those providers in that, that uh, providing the services for you and utilize them as well to brainstorm with. But you move at the, the speed of trust, dignity plus respect plus honesty over time builds trust. It's going to take time. So first you buy in and then get them to buy in that way. I think perfectly well said. I would just add sharing success stories has been really, really impactful for us as a guardian. Yep. Wanda, I think you're on mute, maybe. I keep meeting myself so you don't hear all the other chaos in my home while you're speaking. <laughs> so, um, but uh, he responded that the, the speed of trust, wise words, thank you. So. Yeah, and I would add just, to, you know, we're always open. So 
you know, anytime anybody's out there wants to learn more about our experience, we're happy to share information with other agencies, other individuals, families, wherever the case may be. Yeah, any of us are, and I know Tim does this, I do this. I've in the last month I've talked to a couple two or three different provider agencies that are reaching out, asking questions. You know, the nice thing about generally this network around the state is everybody's willing to help everybody. So mm -hmm. Well, we have no questions um, left in the box. And so, again, I just want to thank you. I feel like this was a very powerful conversation that will be very meaningful to share with others who weren't able to attend. So I really appreciate your time and, um, and we will talk again some other time. Thanks for all of your support. All right, thanks everybody. Bye-bye.